I'm Guy Goodwin, and I'm the new chief executive of the uh, National Centre for Social Research, uh, which is the largest independent social research agency in the UK. Um, and it's a real privilege to be here today in my first month in the job. And it occurred to me that on the 23rd of June, two things are going to happen with uh, almost complete certainty, I would suggest. Um, one is that there is going to be a vote and a decision on the EU uh, membership, and the second is that the opinion polls are going to be wrong. Um, now, I say that in a little bit of a controversial way, and given I've got three experts next to me, I'm going to say, or at least some of the opinion polls are going to be a poor proxy for how people actually uh, vote on the day, which I guess is more factually, factually accurate. Because if you look at uh, some of the latest polls, including a very recent one, uh, if you look at the telephone responses, then it's clear remain uh, comfortably ahead. And if you look at the internet responses, it is clear that Leave are going to uh, win this referendum. Um, and so that, uh, to a layperson, doesn't appear on the surface to be very helpful. Um, and while commentators seem to be able to say things like, well, leave uh, voters might be more likely to turn out, um, they are, it appears to me, less sure on some of the things like mode effects and whether the telephone uh, responses or the internet responses are going to be correct. So it's just as well that we've got three leading experts here with us today. Um, there's Tom Lutzinski, sorry Tom, uh, the Director of Political Polling from Comres. Tom's going to speak third. We've got Peter Kellner uh, immediately to my left, who is um, a renowned commentator and a former president of YouGov. And then to my far left, uh, who's going to speak first, is Professor John Curtis. Um, John is a senior research fellow at the National Centre for Social Research. He leads what UK thinks. He's a professor from Strathclyde University and one of the UK's leading sophologists. So to open the debate, um, I'm going to ask John to, uh, uh, to start. OK, thanks very much. Um, the reason why we're holding this session is this. Uh, this is an average of um, all of the opinion polls conducted since the Electoral um, Commission settled the question back at the beginning of September. First set is the average figures for remain and leave, taking out the don't know so that everything becomes much clearer. The average level of figures for um, remain in polls conducted between the 1st of September and the 19th of February, 19th of February being the day when uh, David Cameron concluded renegotiations. And it's during that period when it became apparent that phone polls were coming up with higher figures to remain than were internet polls. The second period is between the 19th of February and the beginning of April, and the third period is what's been going on since April. Now, as you see, that the divergence is not entirely consistent. In fact, actually, if you recalculate it, I did this before ORB's poll yesterday. It's now 56 for the telephone polls, but it hasn't shifted. So the telephone polls have come down a bit, but the truth is, on average, the internet polls throughout the whole of the period since last autumn have been saying it's a 50-50 shot. In contrast, Virtually all the telephone polls have been saying that remain not necessarily comfortably ahead, but clearly are well ahead. And in a sense, it's what can we understand about the, these differences and what, uh, which of the two should we believe, if either, that is what we're trying to discuss today. And my, my remarks are going to be um, primarily about some of the possible reasons as to why there might be a difference. I will then talk a little bit much more briefly about some of the evidence that's out there, but much of that is much more of it is, is in a paper that um, will be available on the What UK Thinks website um, uh, by the time that this session is over. Now, I thought, however, hang on, um, don't assume that everybody knows what you're talking about. So I thought we perhaps should just start off with a quick refresher 
as to how a phone and internet polling is done in the UK. Of course, I'm going to summarise horribly, and uh, Tom and Peter will tell you I've not quite accurately said exactly how Comres and YouGov do things, but it's just to quite get the broad point. The crucial thing about telephone polls is essentially a typical telephone poll is dialing landline and mobile numbers probably at random. Okay? So, and it's just relying on statistical theory that says if you interview a thousand people at random, you should get a reasonably representative sample. Although the truth is that when the telephone is answered, um, because younger people and certain other sort of demographics are more difficult to get, if uh, somebody that fits that description is available, the interviewer tries to get hold of them. But it's essentially relying on the process of contacting people at random, not pre-selected, and trying to come up with a representative sample, or at least a sample that can be made to look representative. Internet polls in the UK, at least in contrast, are basically are done amongst people who've already, in some way or another, signed up to take part in an internet survey. They said, oh, I quite like doing this. Um, I'll, I'll sign up and agree to do them. Now, in doing that, they tell the pollsters a lot about themselves, you know, their gender, age, etc. So given they have that information, they can draw from their sample what we'd call a stratified sample, but it's basically, therefore, they can say, well, we'll get so many older people, so many younger people, etc., to try and fill in this survey, and therefore, as a result, we will have something that looks like the population. That's the essential thesis underlying internet survey practice as currently uh, done in the UK. They have common potential pitfalls. The first is that not everybody they try to get hold of will immediately fill in the survey. There's, and there's potential, and the difficulty is if some kinds of people are more easily available or more willing to participate, their samples may no longer be representative. And secondly, the truth is that none of these methods ever succeed in actually achieving exactly the demographic uh, uh, quantities they want. They all, nearly all of them have too few younger voters. Most of them have too few working class voters. So they rely on weighting the data once achieved in order to make it look representative. So that's essentially uh, what they're all engaged in. Um, why might these differences, differences in the way of doing surveys produce differences in the pattern of response? There are essentially two principal explanations that one could think of as to why this might be the case. The first is that there may be a difference between the two methods between how you deal with don't knows. If you're doing any self-completion format survey, such as um, an internet survey, you have to decide, do you offer the respondent don't know or not? And typically, because otherwise people may kind of get a bit unhappy, you offer the choice so that they can say don't know and move on. With a telephone survey, you can either choose to say, well, offer don't know as an option or not, but even if you don't offer it as an option, if the respondent says don't know, you can say, oh, okay, that's fine, I'll put you down as a don't know. And one of the arguments that's been put forward is that perhaps in this referendum, Remain voters are more reticent, and that given the chance to say, oh, I'm not quite sure, they'll take that rather than say, well, yeah, I'm probably going to vote to Remain. Second argument that's put forward is a very long-standing argument between the merits of having the interview or not, is that perhaps there's a social desirability bias. Perhaps people who are none too keen on immigration, therefore none too keen on the EU, and they hear a very nice middle-class interview on the other end of the phone, and they go, you know what, I'm not just going to tell her what I think. And that therefore, if there's a perception out there that certain views are unfashionable, then the argument is that telephone polls are more likely to be susceptible to that problem, and that therefore this may explain why they don't have as many Leave voters. The other possible sources of difference are, so hang on, no, it's not to do with the way in which the survey is administered, it's who the surveys managed to get hold of in the first place. One of the arguments about internet polls is, well, hang on, these are people who all volunteer, they're just too committed to the subject matter and to doing surveys to be possibly be representative. On the other hand, telephone surveys are done over a very short period of time. Uh, one uh, a phone practitioner says, I now have to ring 28 numbers in order to get one positive response. And that therefore, again, other people, the phone surveys are actually managing to get within these constraints necessarily representative. Um, 
And given that perhaps Leave voters are perhaps more politically committed, a lot of evidence to suggest that, does that help to explain why internet polls have more, more Leave voters? Um, and there's also been suggested that maybe phone polls uh, struggle to get representative samples too in a way that might make them more remain. So this is essentially what we are arguing about. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this. The paper does. Let me just take very briefly a couple of examples. The first is to deal with don't knows. There was a very interesting experiment done by Populous, together with Matt Singh of Number Crunch of Politics, in which they asked half a phone sample the, with, with don't know included as a possible option and the other half not. And on the internet survey, they kind of hid the don't know and the other they made prominent. Crucial point to take away is that when you offered people the don't know, more people said don't know. Surprise, surprise. But crucially, notice that support for remain ends up being higher if the don't know option is not offered, and whereas the support for leave is kind of hard, 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 hardly makes any difference. All right? Now, that said, however, clearly, not, even if this is correct, it's not a full explanation of the difference between, phone, between internet and phone surveys, because, as you can see, the support for leave is higher in the internet, in the internet survey than in the phone survey, um, even if you uh, compare like with like, so far as don't know is a concern. But this was, this was an interesting experiment. However, the problem is, is that, and, and it's also true, that on average, don't, uh, telephone surveys have fewer don't knows in them. However, if you actually look within the internet surveys, some of them have lots of don't knows and others don't. And there's no relationship between the level of support for remain and leave between how many don't knows there is in the internet survey and um, how many don't knows there were. And indeed, one of the companies, ORB, has never on its internet surveys offered people the chance to say don't know, and it still ended up coming in with surveys at around the 50-50 mark. So although the experimental evidence is interesting, it doesn't look as though how the question is answered is likely to be the source of the discrepancy. Much more likely is that it's to do with sampling. And certainly one of the things that we know, and here's just an example from ICM, do a parallel internet and a phone survey as they did. And you end up discovering that within each age group, for example, we know that older people are less likely to vote for, uh, leave, for remain than younger people. But within each age group, a, f a typical internet survey just finds more leave voters. Same is true by social grade. Again, we find so evidently the differences between these two samples are things that are going on within some of the cells that pollsters commonly weight their data by. One other thing that we know from British social attitudes, indeed from the British Election Study, from the, edu for, as from the educational side of the trade, the academic side of the trade, is that, however, education is a really big correlate of which way people are going to vote. Now, this comes from BSA, which had a lot of people who wanted to stay inside the, in the EU. But notice the big difference by education. And indeed, both the, B, uh, the B, BSA show, you can show, it's education more than social class that is the source of this division, which therefore raises an interesting question of, well, maybe, maybe one of the reasons why the phone polls have more, more remain uh, voters than leave voters is that maybe they have more graduates in their samples. And indeed, um, it was suggested recently by YouGov that this is indeed the case. Now, here I'm going back to Populous's comparative data. And at least in one of their comparisons, they did two of them, and the, the, right, the second one's on the right-hand side, there were only 31% of graduates in the internet sample, but there were 46% in the Inter, uh, in, in the uh, phone sample, and YouGov said, hang on, look, this really perhaps helps to explain why they've got different results between the two. So YouGov themselves, perfectly honourably, came along and said, ah, right, well, I know what we therefore should do, is we'll do our own experiment, and we'll do our own experiment in which we actually weight the data by, not by whether the person has a degree or not, but at what age they finish their full-time education. And they did when they did the internet survey themselves. Now, as an internet survey company, they don't have the ability to do phone polls, but they commissioned another agency to do it. And they did it, and they waited it by education, and lo and behold, they got the phone poll to look like the internet poll. So it looked as though from this, aha, indeed, if we do actually take into account education, which most polls have not been doing so, then actually, indeed, a phone poll looks like an internet poll, and that there are indeed too many graduates in a phone poll. However, there was one problem with YouGov's experiment. 
and that is that they demonstrated that it was possible to conduct a phone poll that not had too many graduates, but too few. In fact, the, in the unweighted data in YouGov's uh, phone poll, only 22% of the, sample, the phone sample was uh, finished uh, education at age 20 or more, whereas in the internet sample it was 36, and, and it was around 36, 37 that they regarded as being their target. So this kind of, in the end, muddied the waters because, OK, we've got evidence that populist survey, one of them at least had rather, uh, rather more graduates than the other, but we can't apparently assume that this is true of all phone polls because YouGov themselves have just vividly demonstrated that you can conduct a phone poll that has too few graduates in it. So that arguably has again rather muddy the waters. So to conclude, um, my view, and there's much more about this in the paper, that probably the answer to this conundrum does lie not in how the inter phone and internet polls were administered, but much more in differences in their achieved samples. Um, that, however, what is perhaps remarkable on both sides of the fence is that for the most part, polls do not seem to be taking into account one of the de key demographics of the referendum education, which therefore means that we have relatively limited publicly available evidence on whether or not phone polls do or don't have more, uh, too much in the way of graduates, which does, I'm afraid, leave that the rest of us are left none the wiser. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start where John uh, left off, because I think this issue about education is really important. Now, for 16 years, I was an online pollster, and I defended and would still defend online polling methods. The great majority of the time, its results are pretty much the same as those conducted telephone face-to-face. -face. There have been occasions in the past where YouGov's methods were clearly more accurate, YouGov predicted that Boris Johnson would defeat Ken Livingston in 2008. All the telephone polls said Ken Livingston would win, so on. Up to last autumn, YouGov getting the Labour leadership pretty well spot on, to the uh, amazement in terms of YouGov's initial poll showing Corbyn ahead. The, the, um, many people were uh, <coughs> stunned by that. Um, so, in saying as I now do, that I think the online polls are getting the EU referendum wrong, I think the telephone polls more nearly right, I am making something, saying something very specific about this campaign on this issue at this time. Um, and as John said, YouGov, uh, which has always been a very transparent company, did this very interesting um, study on education. And the reason why John could put up that chart showing the raw data was because YouGov, to its great credit, not only produced a report about what it had done, but put all the data, the data sets, online for anybody to play with as they wish. Um, now, in order to get weighting by education, which I think is an extremely good and important data, and done properly, may can achieve convergence in the next four weeks in the polls, convergence towards a sort of common degree of accuracy, we've got to get the numbers right. So, how many graduates are there in the electorate? It's not a straightforward question to answer, partly because the latest official data is not completely up to date. So what I've done is I took the 2011 census. That says that 27% of everybody aged 16 and over is a, has a, a degree or equivalent or higher qualification. 27%. That's of age 16 and over. Well, let's knock off the 16 and 17 year olds and say 18 and over. I think, reckon that pushes the figure up by one percentage point of 28%. That was five years ago. We know from a variety of sources, um, best of all the Labour Force Survey, because it does it twice a year, that the proportion of graduates has been increasing rapidly. But what the Labour Force Survey does is look at data by people in the labour market, which they define, in this instance, as women aged 21 to 59 and men aged 21 to 64. So I'm, I think I'm in the labour market, but I'm over 65, so I don't count. Anyway. The latest figure that I could find is that um, defining, as it were, graduates, I think the same way as the census, 
and their population in terms of the labour market, they came up with 38%. That was in 2013. But they produced a lovely little graph showing how that percentage has grown over the previous 20 years. And it grows pretty fast and pretty steadily. So, going back to the census figure, 28% uh, graduates five years ago. What the Labour Force Survey figure suggests is that over the five years up to 2013, it went from 31 to 38%. Hope you're still with me. A seven point increase in five years. So, what I've done, in the absence of any better way of doing the estimate, I've added seven point percentage points on to the 2011 census figure. So, I reckon there are now, best guess, around 35% of graduates among the population of voting age. 35. 28 plus 7. 35. That's the population. The electorate is slightly different. Um, and if you look as I've done, it's not difficult, but it's tedious. If you compare the ONS data of electorate by constituency with population aged 18 plus by constituency, what you find, and it should come as no surprise, is that the, the degree of non-registration, that is the gap between the population of 18 plus versus the electorate, the gap, the under-registration, is significantly higher in those constituencies where there are the fewest graduates and the most people who left school at 16. What you do with that a matter of judgment, I reckon, that it adds another one to two percentage points to the proportion of graduates in the electorate. So we get to 36 or 37 per cent of graduates in the electorate. But we also know, and this is far more obvious and easy to ascertain, that the turnout last year, as in every general election, is very much higher in constituencies with a high graduate population than in constituencies with a high school leaver population. Um, if you take the top 50 by education, the lowest 50 by education, you go on for a 25 point gap in turnout. 75% or thereabouts for the constituencies with a high graduate content, 50 to 55% in the constituencies with the fewest graduates and the greatest number of people with no educational qualifications. Now, one has to make some leaps of judgment here, but my judgment is that I've tried to, as it were, take the most cautious assumptions and then what I think is the realistic assumption. It seems to me that the proportion of people who voted in last year's election, between 41 and 45 per cent of them were graduates. Um, now, the significance of this is that you're getting somewhat nearer the telephone figures that John showed. It may be different in the referendum. You know, maybe the gulf in turnouts between the highest and least educated electors will be much smaller. And that is what the polling data indicates. The trouble is, the polling data also um, was not very good a year ago in picking up that huge gulf in turnout between different social groups. And that may be one of the factors underlying the polls getting it wrong. So um, let me make two final points. One is, one of the difficulties in all this is that when a pollster tries to ask by whatever means, at the highest qualification. This is actually a very complex question. So there may be people who have qualifications which the government defines as graduate level who don't think they're graduates. There are the other people, I suspect rather more, who have qualifications which they regard as equivalent to a degree, but the government does not. So there's a fuzziness 
around this data. But let me come up, bring off you what I think is the final point which supports the view that if in a survey you're getting graduate voters in the order of 30%, you're seriously underestimating it. It's this, that over the last few weeks, pretty well every online poll that has asked voting intention has had UKIP at around 18%. And every telephone poll has had it around 12 to 14%, although the, a recent Mori one had it at 10%, which looks to me too, too low. And I think we know from the elections in London, Scotland, Wales, local authorities early this month that 18% is simply too high and that 12 to 14% is more realistic. Now, YouGov um, got that uh, UKIP too high in London, Scotland, and Wales. To YouGov's credit, it's acknowledged this and has tweaked its samples to try and amend this. My perception of it is that that tweak has, has been too small, but it is addressing the issue. So I endorse John's call for education to be brought in to the sampling and waiting. Um, it's going to be bloody difficult for the reasons I gave, but my personal judgment is that if it is done, one will be looking for the proportion of people giving a voting intention who are graduates to be at least 40%. If it is much lower than that, I think it will indicate that the figures for UKIP and for Brexit are overestimated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's quite rare for a, for a pollster to give a presentation without PowerPoint, but speaking after John and Peter, I felt I'd only be deleting slides as I went through. So um, I've tried to sort of, uh, a bit of reaction to what's being said as well as uh, sort of looking forwards ourselves. Um, the first thing for me to say really is at Comres we are method neutral. So we do telephone polling, we do online polling face to face, we do whatever we feel is most appropriate for uh, the particular project, the particular objectives <coughs> of that project. We do voting intention, both telephone and online, um, though at the last general election for the official campaign, we moved to just telephone polls um, for the six weeks of the campaign, which is a similar decision to that we've made for the EU referendum, where we're only going um, to do telephone polls for the referendum campaign. Uh, and the second thing, just briefly before I come back to methodology, is to say that it's important to remember that actually none of the polls, whether they're telephone or online, are predicting the referendum at this stage. We're, just, we're a month away yesterday from the referendum. At no stage are we saying that the res what our polls are saying now is what is going to happen on referendum day. We see things move. Uh, we, we saw in Scotland at the referendum uh, things narrowed before slightly widening out again. We're seeing things narrowing again perhaps to, to widen out again or perhaps to continue narrowing. We'll see. Um, but I think that's important to say that no prediction at the moment is being made off these polls. We're, we're, what we're trying to do, and perhaps the most difficult thing is that we are trying to reflect sentiment among the public at the moment. And the other thing uh, to mention on top of that, uh, where John was talking about how we sample what we're looking for in terms of trying to find a representative sample of the population, that's our first goal. But then for our political polls, what we then have to do is try to work out who's actually going to vote. And that's, for us, certainly at Comres, and I think for all pollsters, the biggest challenge and perhaps one of the biggest reasons uh, for the miss, the polling miss uh, last year, was that calculation from a, from a public, general public sample to finding that portion of the public that will vote. The difficulty is we never know in advance what turnout is going to be. We also don't actually have any uh, formal register anywhere of who actually voted. So the only record of who voted, whether it's old, young, uh, male, female, northern, southern, etc., um, the only demographics of turnout we have are from survey data itself. Um, so that, again, is an additional challenge in terms of trying to find uh, the, way the electorate uh, when we come to doing um, our polling. But nonetheless, it's talk, been talked about in terms of the divergence and the one that exists. Um, 
We ourselves at Comrades, we noticed this, tri uh, this, this trend um, last year. We ran a, um, a trial. We published the data back in December in terms of running um, a telephone poll and an online poll using our same methods, using our same weighting schemes on both. Um, and we found exactly the same, that leave uh, the online, it was a Thai telephone, a large lead for Remain. Now, unfortunately, I don't think there is any silver bullet answer as to why that, that difference exists. I think there are a number of things that go into it. Um, John and Peter have talked about some of the demographic information that might be different. We know traditionally UKIP do better, or by better, I mean um, traditionally UKIP do slightly higher in, in uh, online polls than, um, than in telephone polls. Um, but I also think there's an attitudinal difference, and we've seen that um, borne out. We think there's an, an engagement gap partly to do with the don't knows, but actually, if you're in an online poll, you have chosen specifically to sign up to that panel, whether it's YouGov, whether it's Comrades, whatever. You've joined a panel, you will, you will be completing a number of surveys over the course of weeks or months. Um, you're therefore slightly hypersensitized. You have been exposed to some of the questions, the issues. You're thinking about it a bit more um, than perhaps the general public. Um, and actually, what we found in, in online polls just, just slightly, in particular, on, on some issues more than others, but online pe uh, people in online polls tend to be slightly more negative attitudinally um, on a whole range of issues. Um, clearly, we're seeing in a much bigger way um, that difference borne out on the referendum. So, there are a few other things we've talked about, sort of the, the demographics and age. In our telephone polls, we're getting 90-year-olds answering, um, which is not the case, I think, in most online polls. Um, and, and age is a big issue in terms of if you imagine who is online, um, online penetration is much lower among older people. So are those people that are online and then in an online panel as representative of the rest of the public? That's not to say that telephone surveys are perfect. Um, every methodology has its flaws. Again, there is an element of self-selection. We're ringing people. We can only interview those people that answer their phone um, and that agree to take part and answer our questions. Um, so they, everyone has a flaw, but we have to, to work with those and, and correct for those where we can. Um, and indeed, in London, there was a, a particular reason for, um, to do online. Peter explained that YouGov got Boris's victory, uh, where telephone pollsters didn't. Um, and we, as I say, we're doing our voting intention telephone, but actually at Comrades, we did our London mayoral election polling online. It makes sense in London. It's a much more transient population. It's a younger population. Um, phone uh, penetration and the such doesn't work quite as well in London. We did it online, and like the other pollsters, we got it spot on. So um, always we're trying to work out what's the most appropriate. In terms of answering the question of can we trust the polls, um, we've done a hell of a lot of work in trying to work out what happened in May last year, how to fix it, how to move forwards. Um, at Comres, the biggest thing for in our polls that we found was an issue of differential turnout. So we got far too many people saying that they would vote in May last year, um, and then uh, those, too many of those people said they would vote, said they would vote for Labour. And so we had an issue with over-representation of Labour, under-representation of the Conservatives. And that gets to the difficulty of working out who is actually going to vote um, and getting the turnout bit right. So what we have done, we've looked outside of just survey responses. Every pollster adjusts slightly for turnout. Uh, for example, um, some, if you say you didn't vote in the last election, you might be weighted down slightly because we know you're unlikely to vote in this one. Um, but clearly those, those adjustments weren't working strongly enough. So we went back, um, we looked at ward level and constituency level turnout data um, and plotted that against demographics. And it's uh, really interesting. It's not necessarily rocket science, but interesting nonetheless to see the correlation between the constituencies with the lowest average age um, has the lowest turnout, and the relationship between the lowest levels of affluence also have lowest levels of turnout. Interestingly enough, at the last election, the constituencies with the lowest turnout, the, the 10 lowest turnout, were all Labour constituencies, um, which tells you something about sort of um, levels of affluence and age, and also the support for the Labour Party. And actually, Tristram Hunt's constituency in Stoke was the lowest turnout constituency. Um, so what we have done, we now model um, turnout based on our voting intention polls. Um, so we not only we don't just ask people how likely they are to vote, but we simulate likelihood based on um, the regression analysis that we've done. As I say, plotting that that correlation between age and, and uh, social grade affluence, um, and we now simulate people's likelihood to vote based on their demographic data. 
Um, and that helps us, looking back to 2015, our final poll moves from a one-point Tory lead to a five- or six-point Tory lead. Obviously, still not enough, but it helps. Comfortingly, in terms of uh, not just artificially moving Labour, which is not what we wanted to do, we wanted something a bit more uh, pure than that, rather than just lumping Labour down a bit to help us, uh, we applied it back to our 2010 polls, where, if you remember, the Conservatives and Labour were, were more or less right, but actually most people overstated the Liberal Democrats. And our model in 2010 helps to move Liberal Democrats down towards their uh, closer to where they actually fell. So we have some confidence in that. A few weeks ago in London uh, was our first live trial of the model, um, and that helped in terms of uh, without the model, we would have overstated uh, Sadiq Khan's victory um, by a few points. It helped to bring it down, and actually, we were the only pollsters not to overstate Labour's position, which is the sort of traditional error uh, in, um, in, uh, in polling that you tend to overstate the uh, Labour vote and understate the Conservatives. So in, in London it worked, but it's still obviously a challenge. Now the big challenge for the referendum is that this model is based on election turnout patterns. Um, a referendum is completely new and different to us all. We can all uh, make fairly educated guesses about what we think turnout is going to be at the referendum, but that's the most it will be. Uh, we, don't, we don't have patterns necessarily to work off. The last referendum on this issue back in 75 turnout was 65%, which was around 10 points lower than the general election turnout at that time. So as a rule of thumb, that's quite useful, but not necessarily helpful. So we are having to explore how that turnout model, we, we expect the patterns to remain the same, that younger people are less likely to vote, that less affluent people are less likely to vote, but in what degrees that exists is something we, we're needing to monitor and adjust for. Um, as I say, to try and answer the question, we're, we're fairly confident. We're not here to bash online polling or any other form of polling. We all want to get it right. That's what all us pollsters do. We don't try to drive an agenda. At the end of the day, our, our, block, our heads are on the block. Come election day, we need to get it right. Our confidence at this stage, and has been throughout, is in the telephone polling method. Everything we've done, we've made other adjustments in terms of doing it more bespoke, more control over quotas, taking longer time in fields, all things that the BPC inquiry talked about. But the turnout adjustment, we think, is going to be particularly important in working out that level of who actually votes.